Hi everyone, welcome to flower class. My name is Rachel, I'm the owner of Helen Olivia, and I'm going to be teaching today's master class, which is all about a beautiful garden style of design. Um, we have beautiful flowers for class today, lots of the best springy blooms. Um, I'll show you my buckets, it's overflowing. So uh, we're going to make a gorgeous, asymmetrical, lush garden design in the bespoke style. Um, bespoke design style is uh, from Great Britain. It's a British term and bespoke uh, translates to um, a design that's made for a partic particular person. So it's uh, much more of a personal um, custom style of design, very unique. Um, it's very trendy right now. A lot of wedding work that you see is what we call bespoke style design and it usually has soft airy elements to it. So. We'll create something really stunning today. A um, couple of little housekeeping notes before we dive in. So everyone should hopefully have a couple of things in front of them. Um, the first is your vase. Um, this is a new favorite container of mine. It's from a uh, supplier called Accent Decor, who is based in Atlanta. Um, and they source containers from all over the globe. So uh, this is a really beautiful boat style of uh, vase. Um, I love using boats uh, because they tend to uh, give us beautiful control when we arrange um, and allow us to get really pretty linear lines. So uh, this is definitely a favorite. You'll want to fill it with a little bit um, of room temperature water all the way up to about an inch beneath the baseline. Um, you also should have chicken wire, which is what we're going to use to create some structure on the inside of your vase. So the flowers sit where we put them. Um, you also should have a little formula sheet so you can follow along. It lists out all of the varieties of flowers that we'll be using. Um, and then lastly, your bucket of flowers. Um, I also recommend grabbing some type of floral design tool. I'll quickly talk you through and I'll hold them up closer. My two favorite tools. Um, most professional florists are pretty particular about what they design with. Um, these are my clippers. This is a Japanese company called ARS. Um, a lot of you message us after workshop and ask what tools um, we like. So um, ARS is my favorite. They never dull, they hold up a long time. Um, so this is linked in our Amazon shop. So if you go to our Instagram profile, click on the link, it's a link tree link, and then go to our Amazon store, you'll find these ARS clippers. Um, and then I also design most of the time with a floral knife. Um, this is a Swiss Army knife, uh, it folds on itself. Um, and if you're interested in getting a little bit more advanced with your floral design, I would definitely recommend um, playing around with a knife. So you'll see that I uh, work with both of these tools. I kind of switch back and forth between them. Um, and a lot of times I pick my tools based on the type of stem that I'm cutting. So if it's a very woody stem, sometimes I'll use my clippers and if it's a softer stem, my knife. Um, both serve different purposes. Uh, so without further ado, why don't we go ahead and jump in. Um, the first thing we need to do is get our chicken wire kind of balled up and into our base. Uh, so everyone has, this is about like an eight and a half by 11 size sheet of chicken wire. Um, so I love to just kind of roll my chicken wire, I always call it the chipotle burrito, but into the shape of a chipotle burrito. So I just roll it and then I fold the ends in. And I try not to injure myself at this point. Um, all right, so I've got a little burrito uh, that I'm just going to pop into my container. Um, and this is not going to fill the entire container. Um, it's going to sit kind of towards the middle. Um, and that's totally fine. It's just there to give us some initial structure with our first ingredients. Um, and then as we go, the stems crossing will give us plenty of structure to finish out our design. Um, so before we start arranging, I like to kind of think in my head of a roadmap of where I want to go. Um, and this particular design that we're going to make, I am actually going to create something that's more one-sided. Um, I think a lot of folks, especially people who religiously take Helen Olivia workshops, are really used to making an all-sided centerpiece style of design. Um, and so uh, we never really think that sometimes we can throw that rule out the window and we can design something that's just one-sided. Um, a one-sided design is really appropriate if you're putting your design up against a wall or if it's only being viewed from one side. 
So think about this design as something that would make a beautiful um, foyer table piece, or you could set um, on your kitchen counter up against your backsplash. Um, and this just allows us to make something really jaw-droppingly beautiful and focus all of our flowers in one direction. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, anytime I design, I like to generally start with a base of either greenery or hydrangea. Um, today we're just going to use hydrangea to layer in a good foundation and we're going to cover it up with our flowers. We're really not going to see it once we get started. Um, so everyone has in their bucket some green hydrangea. Go ahead and rip the plastic sleeves off um, and we're going to peel away some of the leaves on our stem. Um, as you peel back, we're going to take off the low-lying leaves but we are going to save the topmost leaves that kind of cup the flower because they're just going to give us, it's like free foliage in our container. It's going to give us a little bit more coverage. And um, so take a second and just clean these up. If I'm going too fast, just pause me and you can catch up. All right. And with the leaves, you'll notice I just rip off with my hands. You're not hurting the stem if you just tear with your hands. So don't feel like you have to use clippers for this part. Okay. So I have my stems nice and conditioned. Um, this variety of green hydrangea um, is actually called new green and not mini green. A lot of you are used to working with mini green in our workshops. Um, but you'll notice the petals are a little bit um, denser and uh, a little crunchier on the new green. We love this stuff. It comes out of Ecuador. It's a really long lasting, beautiful hydrangea um, and a really nice pop of verdant green, which is great for spring. Uh, so all that I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut my stems at a nice deep angle. Um, and I'll show you this first stem, how deep of an angle I'm trying to cut. So I always say in workshop, you'll notice I open up a lot of surface area. Um, the stems you should think of are kind of like a straw. The more surface area you open up, the more the flower drinks. Um, so definitely make sure to get angled cuts as you go. And we're just going to spread these equidistant all over our base. And again, we're going to cover these up, so uh, don't really worry too much about the placement. Make sure that the stems uh, are deep down into the base so they can drink and that the flowers are really just kind of hugging the base. And I'm keeping all of mine around the rim. I'm not putting any in the center because as you can see from the buckets, we have plenty to go in the center. All right, so that's uh, what mine looks like right now. Um, and this is about as tight in as we're going to put any of our flowers. Most of our flowers we're going to really allow to drape and fall out of the container. Okay, so at this point, uh, now that I've got my base of mini green laid, I want to come back in with some greenery and kind of soften this all up. Um, so when I do garden style design, the order in which I uh, design, I always start, um, if I'm using hydrangea with my hydrangea in first, if I'm not using hydrangea, I go straight to greenery and I create a beautiful base that I can nestle my flowers into. Um, it's kind of like your nest. Uh, you can trace out the shapes and lines of your design and then go back behind and add the flowers on top of the greenery. And I usually put in about 75% of my greenery to begin with when I'm doing garden style design and reserve 25% of it for the end to uh, go back after my flowers are put in and kind of messy it up again. Um, if you are somebody who is used to designing in more of a pave lush style, it can be tricky to rework your brain into a garden style. And so I find that when I save that 25% of greenery for the end, if I look at my finished product and I think, oh my God, this is too tight, too dense, I can add in some really loose and airy pieces of greenery and I feel much better. So that's why we're saving a bit. Um, in our bucket, we have some really gorgeous greenery options. I'll talk you through what's here. Um, and the buckets are super full, so just uh, be patient as you dig through. You'll find hidden treasures in there. Um, if you prefer, you can always lay your ingredients out on the table in front of you. You just want to make sure that you really recut the stems when they go into water. So I'm pulling out right now um, 
Pennycress or Telospi, which is a really gorgeous airy green. Um, this is <laughs> so funny that it's sold as a high-end uh, greenery in the uh, European market. This is imported from Holland, um, but in the United States, a lot of you are recognizing this is the weed that grows in your front yard. Um, so another man's, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, I have Blooming Pieris, which is really pretty. Some of you may know it as Andromeda, and that does grow locally. Um, and then the last thing that I'm fishing out of my bucket is my Little Leaf Pittosporum. Um, also flying in from Holland. I'm realizing as I look through my buckets, this is a Dutch heavy class. Uh, we've got a lot of pretty ingredients coming from Holland for sure. Um, so we're going to take our greens and really trace out the shape of our design, um, keeping in mind that every ingredient has a different purpose. So um, if you are a gardening buff, you've heard, especially for planters, you've heard the uh, spill, thrill, and fill terminology. So that kind of applies to floral design as well. So um, we want to find ingredients that create that spill or drape. Um, and for sure, that is going to be our Pieris. Has a nice lean and bounce to it. Um, and a little bit of our little leaf pit also gives us that drape. Um, and then our uh, thrill or our uh, linear item would be our penny crest, which is more of a vertical green. Um, so I always like to start with my draping ingredients first. So I'm gonna take my Pieris, and before we get started, we wanna figure out which side of our design is going to be the front of our design, where we're focusing most of our beautiful flowers. So for me, it's going to be right here. This is gonna be my front. Um, and as I teach this class, uh, usually I stand behind and I can do this backwards. I'm gonna come around to the front of the table a bit more because when you're designing in an asymmetrical garden style, you really do need to be looking at it head on. Um, so I'll be moving around a bit more. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just start out with my first draping element. Um, and as we go, you just wanna make sure that any leaves that would fall beneath the waterline, you're just stripping off with your hands. Um, and I'm gonna tuck this guy in so that he drapes. Um, don't be afraid as you uh, put in your draping elements. If you have a stem that you know is not gonna snap on you, you can just gently bend it to get more of a drape. So that's what I'm doing. It's not hurting anything. Okay, there we go. So I've got my first little piece of drape. Um, and I'm going to uh, probably divide up my next piece of Pieris because I have a lot of laterals. So I'll break off one piece. And I'm going to uh, add another piece of drape right over here, just like that. And then I'm going to take my last little piece of Pieris and kind of put it on a back corner. Um, so that's really helping out with softening the line of my design and pulling some interest beneath my baseline. It looks really pretty. Um, and the next ingredient I'm going to play around with is my little leaf pit. So your little leaf pit, you're definitely going to want to break it up into more manageable pieces. Um, so out of my one big stem, I'm able to yield myself four smaller stems. Um, and the nice thing is this vase is such a short vase that you don't really need a ton of stem length um, for the pieces that you're working in lower. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just pocket in my little leaf pit in a few different areas. Remember that the first two ingredients, the little leaf pit and the Pieris, we're really using lower down in our design and we're going to uh, use our penny press, the last greenery, to blow out the height of our design. This is another greenery that you may want to bend a little bit. Okay. And when I bend, I'm just kind of wiggling it down. There we go. Okay. I am gonna take one or two pieces of pit and kind of work them in higher up in my design. I always like to blend. So what I mean by that is if I'm using an ingredient that's low down in my arrangement, I wanna make sure that I uh, pull that ingredient higher up. Um, the reason why that's important is 
unless you're doing something very specifically or like a really modern grouped design, you don't want to wind up with all of one type of ingredient lower down and then all of another type of ingredient higher up because it'll wind up looking like some type of strange collar of um, you know, pit just along the baseline and then something else higher up in the arrangement. So we like to blend intentionally as we go. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create my first little bit of height and it's going to be asymmetrical. Now, if you are somebody who takes Helen Olivia workshops or designs regularly and uh, tends to gravitate more towards a pave style, this is going to feel very wrong um, and it's going to look wrong for the first part of the design. So uh, just keep the faith, breathe through it. Um, it will look beautiful in the end. Um, but these first few pieces of flyaways are going to look like some crazy Dr. Seuss design and that is normal. You should be feeling a little uncomfortable right now. Um, so I'm gonna take another piece of beautiful little leaf pit and uh, put it off to the side as well. So we're creating a little bit of asymmetry right now. So we're bringing height here and we have a really pretty drape on this side. And we're gonna continue along that line as we design. We're going to really um, be building movement and height throughout. All right, so with our penny press, um, I'm just gonna work this in all over my design as well. I'm gonna tuck more pieces that kind of spray out this side. And um, so again, I'm really bringing height and asymmetry. And I'm gonna save a nice big piece of penny crest and putting it to the side for the end. So at the end, if I feel like my arrangement is looking a little bit too dense, I'm gonna come back and re-layer that in. So we wanna make sure to save a little bit of greenery. Okay, so uh, a lot of times in design, we try to counteract or counterbalance um, our asymmetry. So I'm building height over here um, and I'm balancing it by putting drape on this side. So you'll notice that this other piece of penny crest that I've tucked in is a little bit lower. So that's very intentional. So height here, lower and drape on this side. All right, so we are going to next reach for our beautiful Dutch lilac. So we have kind of a medium lavender lilac. Lilac comes in a bunch of different colors. So uh, it comes in white and it comes in dark purple, medium purple lavender, and light lavender. Um, and it also comes in a blush. It's kind of like a mauve color, which is more rare. Um, Lilac is one of the most coveted spring blooms. It grows locally, so uh, it's something you should keep an eye out for once we get into a little bit warmer of weather. So I would say early to mid-May is kind of the height of lilac season in Virginia and Maryland. Um, and it is a little bit finicky, so we want to handle our lilac with extra care. Um, anytime you see a stem that looks really woody, like lilac, you want to uh, split your stem straight up the middle, or you might even want to hammer or smash your stem, um, which sounds violent, but the flower really likes it. So uh, what I'm gonna do, I'll just come up close to show you, is I am just going to split right up the middle of my stem. Okay, just like that. And this is the same cut that we're gonna make on our viburnum. The reason why we do this with a woody stem is because uh, the outside of the stem is so thick that the flower can't drink through it. Um, so we really need to open up a ton of surface area so the flower can absorb water and lives a longer time. Um, so with our lilac, we're going to kind of layer it um, on top of the pieris because lilac is another one of those flowers that gives us yummy drape. Um, so I'm gonna put one piece in on the low side of my design. I'm fighting with my chicken wire. Oops, there we go. All right, so I've got my lilac pocketed in. I'm gonna come around and kind of see how this is looking. I'm going to take my other two pieces of lilac and kind of bulk this other side. So I'll put one right here, nice and low. And then I'm gonna put my last piece of lilac uh, really high up that. So you can see we're really still filling out that asymmetrical line. The next ingredient that we're going to work in 
is going to be our beautiful Snowball by Burnham. This is another one of those ingredients that really gives us the opportunity to make nice uh, movement in our design. Uh, so with our viburnum, you can handle it a couple of different ways. If you want to just separate off um, the individual laterals, you can certainly do that. That's where the new growth on the stem is. Um, and these are great to work in right around the baseline. Um, I'm going to do that with one or two of them. And then I'm also going to use my viburnum to create a little bit of height and movement in my design. This is good to fill out the midsection of your arrangement. And again, this is a stem that you want to splice so it can really drink. Okay, just like that. All right, so the next thing that we're going to pop in um, will be our beautiful green hellebore. Hellebore is one of my favorite flowers. Uh, I wait all year for it to come in season. Um, not all hellebore are created equally. So there are some hellebore that have a very, very short base life, and there are other hellebore that are very lasting. Um, this particular variety, this uh, smaller green variety, is one that I bring in from Holland, and it is super lasting. Um, the ones that I have trouble with when I design white hellebore, I don't recommend it. It's very frustrating. It usually dies within a day or two of going into a vase. Um, also some of the bicolor hellebore, the white with the purple and red rims, I don't have good luck. Um, and a lot of the frilly varieties like the double and triple layer hellebore, also no luck. Um, there are varieties that you can grow in your backyard and the penny variety is super, super long lasting. I have great luck with it. Um, so that's a good one for floral design. If you're growing with the intention of cutting it, I recommend the penny pink. Um, all right, so we're going to take our hellebore and we're gonna kind of mix it throughout our design. Hellebore is another one of those flowers that has great lean and bounce to it. Um, I always find myself, I know it sounds silly, but every time I'm picking up a flower, I'll kind of wiggle it and see what it's doing, what it wants to do. And that kind of governs where in the design it'll go. Um, and it's important to do that because you can see uh, within the same variety, this hellebore naturally just wants to be straight up and down. And this hellebore is asking to lean. So we like to kind of listen to the stems. Um, with a garden and bespoke style of design, um, don't be afraid to leave your stems longer and really allow your flowers to cascade out of the vase. So this hellebore is one of those flowers that I will do exactly that. Um, so I've cut my stem, I'm gonna leave it a little bit longer and I'm gonna allow it to kind of trail out of this vase and get some nice movement. Um, so this is kind of dripping down. My hellebore that's more linear, I'm gonna use to get some vertical height. And my other hellebore, I'm gonna allow him to kind of sit off to the side. So I'm going to press pause with my airy greens and I'm going to now kind of dive into my bulking, um, my airy flowers and greens, and I'm going to now kind of dive into my bulking flowers. Um, and these are the flowers that are going to give us some weight in our design. These are also the flowers that we're going to leave a little bit closer into our baseline. Um, so we are going to start out with our beautiful uh, purple garden rose. This is a new variety. It's called Queen's Crown um, and I'll hold it up for you. It's got a really, really great petal count, so really roughly beautiful. Um, if you're familiar with the country home line of roses, it's very similar to the uh, purple country home. So I'm gonna take these roses, and as I place them, I'm gonna do something that we don't normally do in our Helen Olivia signature style. Um, I'm actually going to play around with the depth um, that I put the roses in. So I'm just taking a second to strip leaves off of the stems, just like that. And then I'm taking off a few guard petals. So when I'm designing for myself, I tend to take fewer guard petals off. I'm just not bothered by the discoloration on the outside. I think it's a character thing. Um, if you are bothered by it, certainly you could take off more guard petals. Um, personal choice. 
Um, and I can also, if I want to open up the face of my rose more, I can blow on it. Okay. It's funny, we uh, oftentimes when we design, we blow on our roses um, just to open them up a bit more around them out. And in the times of COVID, because we're wearing masks and also we just don't wanna be blowing on people's flowers, we haven't been doing that. And that's been a real adjustment for us. Um, so a lot of our arrangements, we have slightly tighter roses than we're used to working with. Um, just one of those weird things with the pandemic that you don't think about. Um, so as I was saying, we're gonna play around with the dimension of our rose placement. So rather than having our roses sitting perfectly flush with one another, we're going to um, recess some of our roses and let other roses kind of peek out a bit more. So I'm going to look at my design and figure out where I want to pocket my roses. Um, so I think I'll kind of stick to this area right here where I've got a nice opening. Um, so I'm gonna place my first rose. At this point, because stem length is going to be a little bit more um, of a moving target, I would say start with keeping your stems longer. You can always cut them shorter. Um, you don't want to make the mistake of cutting your stem too short and then not, you know, not be able to place your flower where you really want to. Um, so I'm going to pop my first rose in. And this guy I'm allowing to kind of hang out a little bit. You can see that he's sticking out. And the next one I will recess. So I've recessed the next one in, and I'll put another one in. I'm making a little grouping of three. So this guy's going to hang out even farther. So creating that nice dimension. One of the things as you're really working on your finishing skills as a designer that is important, um, all of your roses are going to be slightly irregular, and they're not all perfectly round. So if you ever put a rose in your arrangement or if you're making a bridal bouquet and it just doesn't feel right, um, you can try just rotating it um, counterclockwise or clockwise. And that will, for me, always changes the way I feel about my rose placement in a design. So before you take a stem back out of the arrangement because you don't like it, try this trick, um, just rotating it a tiny bit. All right, so I've got my first trio right here. I'm gonna balance this out by putting another lavender rose off to this side. So I've got one that's a little bit more recessed and then I'm gonna pop another one in that's going to come out a little bit more. So I'm creating really beautiful movement um, in my design and I'm gonna do this as I add the rest of my flowers. All right, so I'm gonna go back now and I'm gonna play with my Peach Myra garden roses. Peach Myra are a recent find of mine. I wasn't really familiar with Peach Myra um, until this year. Um, they are a beautiful apricot um, peachy color. There's a lot of variation within this rose, so sometimes you wind up with a rose that has more of a pink undertone. Um, this one is more of a yellowy orange, all within the same bunch. Um, that could be problematic if I were designing for a bride for a wedding, um, but uh, luckily none of us are getting married. The color variation is not a big deal. Um, these garden roses definitely do have guard petals. I am not offended by these guard petals, so I'm just gonna leave them on. Um, and this garden rose is gonna open to be really a lot bigger over the next few days. So um, once the flower starts to relax and open and come to temperature, you're really not even gonna see the guard petals because it's gonna kind of unfurl on itself. So I'm not gonna waste any energy peeling them. Um, I'm going to work on popping in my Peach Myra's next. Um, so again, just be uh, precise about whether you want to recess your rose or allow it to kind of hang out a little bit more. I'm gonna do a group of two right here and then I'll add my last Peach Myra um, kind of spraying off to this side. I think it's really pretty. Okay. So our next ingredient is another type of garden rose. Um, these are called Princess Crown. They're of the same family as the purple one. Um, and these are 
uh, interesting garden roses. They do not look spectacular when they are tight, but as these open over the course of your arrangement's life, they're going to become really, really impressive. Um, I like this color because it's more of a cool toned peach. Um, I was not somebody who was aware of um, all of the different shades and why they were important before I started floral design, but now I am definitely really mindful of all of the different undertones and shades, um, especially when I'm working on events. Um, so this I would say is more of a cool toned, very soft peach. These do have yucky guard petals, so I'm just ripping them off. They also have thorns, I'm sorry about that. Um, so just be careful as you condition your stems. All right, so I'm gonna blow on them. They're so tight that it's not really doing much of anything, um, but over the span of a day or two, you'll really start to see these um, open up and they are just so beautiful. These will get huge in your design. All right, so I'm gonna work these uh, peach ones in. I'm gonna give some love to the top part of my arrangement. I just wanna pop a few. Uh, roses in to kind of fill out that space. So I'm going to put one kind of straight up and down. I'll angle the other one towards the back. And then I'm just going to pull this peach color through. I'm going to pop this last one kind of off to the side and I'll recess him a little bit. So you can see with our roses, we've kind of added a little bit of weight into our design. They are great bulking flowers. Um, we do have some that are hanging out a little bit farther, but the roses just don't have that same ability to kind of lean and drape. So um, that's why they kind of lend themselves like the hydrangea to being the inside fill of the, of the arrangement. So now everything else in our bucket, we're going to use to create that beautiful movement. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna work with are my parrot tulips. These are a gorgeous variety called Libretto. They're my favorite tulip, um, and I import these from Holland. Um, they're pretty high in demand as far as tulips go, just because they're so pretty, so springy. Um, and to handle your tulips, all you wanna do is peel off the low-lying greens. Um, tulip stems are always delicate stems, so you don't wanna yank too hard because you'll just snap your stem. Um, and I like to leave on one or two of the topmost leaves. So I'm just getting rid of these low-lying leaves. And I'm going to show you something you can do with your tulips if you want to. Um, reflexing is all the rage right now. And reflexing just means that you are kind of bending back the tulip petals um, to show the innards of your tulip. So to reflex, I'm just very gently peeling back my petals, just like that. So that's what a reflexed tulip looks like. Really gorgeous. Almost does not look like a tulip anymore. Um, so I'm gonna take these tulips and again, I'm gonna kind of look at the direction and the curvature of my stem, figure out what they want to do, and then honor that. Um, so I'm going to take my tulips and use them to kind of elongate um, my design. Okay, so I'm really allowing these to hang out quite far. I'm gonna put two of my tulips together in the arrangement. I'm gonna reflex all of mine. I just love the look of a reflex tulip, but it's personal choice. If you are not feeling this, definitely don't feel like you have to. The cool thing about tulips, of course, is that they are um, bulb flowers, so they'll continue to grow. And they are also phototropic, so they're going to curve and move towards the light. Um, so if your window is over here, you can expect your tulips in the morning to have crept out of your design by about an inch or two. Um, so if that drives you crazy, you can always cut your tulips and tuck them back into place. Other people think that it's like a personality thing and whimsical and fun, so you can uh, just let your tulips do what they do. Okay, so I'm peeling back. That was a good reflex, really pretty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and work this tulip in kind of on the other side just to balance my design. So 
So really coming together and looking pretty. All right, so my next ingredient, um, I'm going to play with my lavender spray roses. Full disclosure, this was a last minute addition to your bucket. We had these in the shop and they are not in good enough shape to go out in retail arrangements. So I just threw them in as an added bonus for class. Um, if you look really up close, there's definitely some damage to them. Um, go ahead and peel back the guard petals. And I think they're still totally fine to be popped into your design, but if you're bothered by them, just throw them away. There's plenty of flowers in this bucket to fill. A lot of times in the flower shop when flowers are past their prime or there's a quality issue, we send them home with our staff. Today we sent them home with you. Um, and it's fun to have flowers at home. Um, though usually when any of our designers or when I take home flowers, um, it feels a little bit like taking the job home. So I don't tend to have arranged flowers at home. Instead, I will fill up like an old pitcher um, and just shove a bunch of stems inside. Um, I think a lot of people think that if you are a floral designer professionally, you must always have really beautiful, um, you know, done arranged designs at home and that's just not true. The opposite. All right, so spray roses, as we're finding out, are a total pain in the behind when the guard petals don't look good. Takes a lot of effort to get these cleaned up. So just bear with me. You're probably pulling your hair out at home too. Okay, here we go. All right, so that's good enough for government work. All right, so we're gonna take our spray roses. These are definitely not um, flowers that have any type of lean to them. As you can see, this is this stem is like straight as an arrow. Um, so I'm just gonna use these to kind of fill the top hat section of my arrangement. Um, and I'm just gonna recess them down. So I'm cutting the stems pretty short. And these can even be used if you want to fill towards the back of your design. You'll notice as we play around with um, our flowers that we've really been deliberate about uh, kind of creating color bridges. So if you've taken any workshops with me, you know that I do not generally like a lot of bright color in my designs. And when I do use color, I like to be really careful to kind of stick within um, one color family. So um, it's a little atypical for me to be mixing like peach cantaloupe with purple, but when I do it, I really like to make sure that I'm blending well. So I've got like the brighter lavenders mixed with more silvery lavenders mixed with the subdued lilac. And, and on the same note, I'm playing around with all different shades of peach. So I've got more of like a cantaloupe color, more of a really soft uh, muted peach. And then my tulips, while butter yellow, also if you look on the rim, have that apricot veining. So it all kind of works together. Um, and that is just way more appealing to me when I design with color to be playing with different gradients. All right, so the second to last ingredient is my favorite flower of all the flowers. Um, I think a lot of people expect me to say that I love peonies the most, uh, but for me, it's the clematis. This is uh, as good as it gets. Um, I love growing clematis at home. It's a vine if you grow it in your backyard, so you need a trellis um, or a lamppost or something for it to grow up. Um, this is a Dutch variety. This is my favorite of all of the mass-produced clematis. And this is, a, a, it's called a London variety, Amazing London. Um, it's just the prettiest lavender and it always comes in super healthy. Um, some clematis, when you buy uh, an import from Holland, it comes in really shriveled um, and not super healthy. This variety never fails me. I, uh, you know, for Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, I want to order what I know is going to come in pristine and immaculate. So I will order 1,000, 1,500 stems of this and out of all of those stems, we'll maybe have 10 that we can't use. So really reliable flower. Um, I am going to uh, peel just the low-lying leaves off my clematis. I'm gonna leave a lot of the greenery on when I place it in my vase. 
Um, I can always go back and cut more away later if I want to, but I just love the movement. And I also love that some of these stems have little buds, like this little guy is so cute. Um, so I'm going to work my clematis in to build a little bit of height on the side of my design that I said was going to be the taller end. And I think I'm actually gonna put all three of my clematis on this side, just group them and allow them to be really the star of the show over here. Okay. So I've got one that's going almost straight up and down. I've got another that's kind of draping out next to my tulip. And I'll put a third one in that's tucked a tiny bit more. Just like that. Oops, my stem is missing the water. Be careful as you go to make sure that all of your stems are actually in there and drinking. So those are my clematis. Um, I like that I can see different sides of the clematis. So this one is showing its face. Um, and these two guys are kind of draping and falling a little bit more. Um, and I'm really happy that I've got height built up on this side. Um, I'm going to make sure that as I finish out my design, I'm using a little bit of that extra greenery to exaggerate that. All right, so our last ingredient I saved for the end because our ranunculus is pretty delicate. The other reason that I saved this for the end is ranunculus has a total mind of its own. Um, I'll show you kind of the lean and the curve of my stems. So they're just doing crazy things. They're like spaghetti noodles. Lots of movement as I bounce them um, and lots of little offshoots and buds. So it's quite common that you'll get a bloom and then like a little stowaway bud. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to work with all of this. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is, if my bud stem is long enough to stand on its own, I'm just gonna separate the two of them. And then I'm gonna get rid of all of the extra greenery that's on my ranunculus stem. Ranunculus, even though they look very delicate, are actually super long lasting flowers. Um, they also will continue to open. So a lot of times we'll get ranunculus in the studio that just do not look particularly spectacular and we'll let them sit in a sunny window for a day or two and they'll really uh, become beautiful. So be patient with your ranunculus. Um, so the reason why I'm holding these until the bitter end is because I kind of want to see the shape of my finished design before figuring out how to position this little oddball stem that's doing uh, almost a 90 degree turn. So I'm going to kind of hold up my ranunculus and figure out what angle is most pleasing. And then I'm gonna cut my stem. I'd recommend cutting your stems kind of on the longer side so that you can play around a bit with the placement. Um, and I'll stick him in. Okay, so I've got my first ranunculus in if I turn on my Lazy Susan, you can see that he's just kind of uh, hanging out beyond the other flowers. Um, I'm gonna put another one higher up that's a little bit more vertical to build some height. This is another one of those flowers, we talked about the roses that oftentimes I have to do like a little bit of a turn. I'll turn them like, uh, you know, a degree or two clockwise or counterclockwise, and then I'll feel more comfortable with how they're leaning. Um, definitely don't be afraid to do that with your ranunculus. All right, so I think I'm going to do the same thing I did with my clematis and pocket my ranunculus all together on one side. So I really like how this guy is kind of leaning low. And my other two, these guys are giving me kind of an eyeball effect since they're so close to each other, so I'm going to move one. Move them a little farther out. All right, so I've got my ranunculus kind of doing its own wild thing. And then I'm going to take whatever's left of my greenery and fill in a bit more. So I'm going to exaggerate my high side. This penny crab is so airy that it really allows you to kind of layer right on top of the flowers, so beautiful. Um, and one area that I want you to make sure that you focus some attention on um, it's bringing dimension to the front. So uh, that's a great area to be popping a little bit of your penny press in. 
so that not only are you having some dimension spraying off to this side, but you also get some pretty dimension here. You can work some in lower on your baseline, all over the place. All right, so that is my finished asymmetric, beautiful garden design. Super happy with how it turned out. Um, a couple of little things that are housekeeping notes for your arrangement. So we have a shallow container, which means that you need to be adding water to this pretty regularly. Um, a lot of our spring flowers are big drinkers. Um, so make sure that you're putting this under your kitchen sink, I would say once a day for sure, and just letting room temperature water rinse through it, push out the old water in with the new, um, and your flowers will be really happy. Um, spring flowers are also very sensitive to heat and sunlight, so make sure that these guys don't sit in a really bright sunny spot. Um, and if you notice that one of your flowers starts to look a little bit unhappy, a um, couple of things you can do. You can always pull the flower out and recut the stem. Um, you can also, uh, sometimes if I have a flower that looks like it is a fleeting beauty, I will actually cut it and recess it a little bit more into my design. Um, a good example is your lilac. So lilac, while beautiful, are not the longest lasting flower. And if I notice that my lilac is starting to crash, I may tuck it a little bit deeper in so I can still see the color and texture of it, but I can't necessarily tell that it's looking floppy. Um, so that's a good trick. Uh, and you can also, this time of year, just add more flowers in on top. So it's a beautiful time to get out in your backyard and cut more flowers and greens to bring new life to your design. Um, Anyway, I hope you enjoyed class. We are going to be releasing a few more master classes through the summer, so stay tuned. They'll be up on the website tonight. Um, and I really had fun with you guys. It's great to be back in the teaching saddle. Hope you enjoyed your class, and I hope you love your beautiful flowers. Thanks so much.